Hey, welcome today to Transformations. Dr. Mike Sherbino, I'm glad you're with us as we complete this series on the book of Nehemiah. We're gonna look at four chapters, chapter 10 through 13, but in the looking at these chapters, we're gonna unpack four leadership principles that we desperately need today. You might say, I'm not a big time leader. Still, the message is for you because we need to learn to lead ourselves and then to lead in our homes and then maybe uh, in our communities and hopefully in our country. You know, leadership is so important. It is so critical. Stay tuned as I unpack these principles that I believe will be life transformational, not just for you, but for the people that are around you. We're glad you're with us today. And here are four leadership lessons that will transform your environment. And the first comes out of chapter 10 of Nehemiah. And I've tried to sum it up this way. It's this, do it right or don't do it at all. Do it right or don't do it at all. You know, sometimes we are guilty of doing things half-baked. And half-baked should not be the description that people think about when they think of you or when they think of me. You know, we need to do it right or don't do it at all. And that's what happens with Nehemiah and he's gonna call the people to that. He is calling the people back to a place of obedience because their spiritual journey and as a nation is kind of up and down like a roller coaster. They start to follow God and then they disobey. Hard times happen and then they start calling and say, okay, God, I gotta get right again. And they come back to him. That's not how we're to live. God wants you and I to live uh, consistently. It was Benjamin Disraeli, uh, the British prime minister, who said the secret of success is constancy of purpose. That is what people are looking for in you and me, that we'll be constant, that we'll be the people who say, you know what, we're, we're gonna do it properly or we're not gonna do it at all. And so here is Nehemiah and he's coming to the people. They've already seen some incredible things and provisions that God has done. And yet, guess what? They're starting to slide away. They're starting to slide away again. And so in first, what he's gonna do as a leader, he's gonna encourage them to follow the instructions to follow the instructions. We see that in verse 29, where he says, they joined together with their brothers or nobles and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. So what is that all about? It was a promise. He's saying, you know, God, we're gonna walk with you. And uh, you know, if not, let your curse be on us, but we're also gonna trust that as we walk with you, that we'll walk in great blessing. I think what we see here is the importance of following instructions. There's so much to be said about the walk that God wants you and I to live with. In Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the path of the ungodly or sit in the seat of the scornful or sit with scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. So much to be said about the way that we walk. Are we following the instructions? Now the problem is, is that many times, we want to follow the instructions for the wrong reason. We want to follow the instructions thinking, you know, if I do this, then God's going to do that. We read in Psalm 1, it says, happy is the person who follows the ways of God. So why do I do that? To get blessing? No, that is not the reason. That is a byproduct. God invites us to follow after him simply for the fact, the joy of knowing him, of being connected with him. He says, when you put me first in your life, the blessing will flow. Jesus had this warning to give to the disciples. He said, the thief, speaking of Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's what happens when we walk. And so here, Nehemiah is saying, follow the instructions. And then he's gonna move on to verse 30 and he's gonna tell them, don't compromise. Now, what is the compromise all about? Because he says some strange things. He said, we're not gonna give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take daughters for our sons. So they said, we're not gonna do the intermarrying. God had forbidden that, why? Because he knew that when that happened, they would start to wander away. They would bring in other ways of worship. They would bring in other things that would draw the hearts of the people away. Why would the people do that anyways? I'm gonna tell you why, it was out of fear. 
They wanted to have good relations with everyone. You know, let's just make everybody happy. Let's have everybody on our side. And, and we see that reflected so much today in society where it's almost forbidden to have an opinion. Matter of fact, the media tells us how we should think, what is appropriate, and what is not appropriate. If I have an opinion that's based on the scripture and I declare it, they're gonna say, hey, that's old fashioned, or you're hate mongering, and all sorts of things, because media wants to tell us uh, how to think, how to act, and what to say, and they wanna bring us down to the lowest common denominator. This is the same thing that Nehemiah was dealing with. He knew that if there was intermarriage, that they would stop trusting God. The second thing was this, they were tempted then to break the Sabbath laws. When the nations would come to Jerusalem to buy and sell, they all wanted to do it on Sunday, on the Sabbath. And the Lord had said the Sabbath is to be a day of rest. What was God teaching through all of this? Well, he knew that we needed a time to recharge and to get you know, energized again for the week, but it was also a day when they could focus on worshiping God, but here it is. Just the same issue of the intermarriage, it's coming to this issue. God is saying, you can trust me. You can trust me. And that is a difficult thing because many times we want to compromise. Nehemiah is going to teach them, do it right or don't do it at all. He says, you can trust God. That was the issue of going through the wilderness. What was God teaching them? He said, I'll give you manna every day. I will provide for you. You walk with me. You see that I will not be more than enough. And I want to remind you today that Jesus is more than enough for your situation and what you're dealing with. The third thing that Nehemiah is going to teach them is to practice generosity. He says in verse 32, um, rather in verse 31, the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, will not buy for them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Wow, it means that they would look to their Jewish brothers and say, you know, after seven years, if you haven't paid the bills, we're not going to let you weigh, be weighed down under that. We're going to release you. How do you do that and be a good business person? You got to trust. You got to believe that your business is God's. And over and over again, we're going to see it in a couple more minutes, Nehemiah is going to call the people to radical generosity. And that's where God calls you and I to, as we learn to tithe, to give him 10%. You know, I think it's a great deal. God gives me $10 uh, in trust, and he says, I just want you to give back $1, 10 to 1. Pretty good deal, isn't it? But we find it hard to do that. And maybe you thought today, and you're listening, say, I've never tithed. I've never put God first in my giving. Where do I start? Well, start somewhere and ask God to help you to grow your faith, to trust him in this way. And you will see how he moves. You know, even as we have taken steps of faith here in the church, we have seen how God has provided. We're seeing that as he's providing even so that we can do an outreach across the country. And how can we do that except to know that as God moves in people's hearts, as he's encouraging you to take steps of faith, he's encouraging people in our food bank. You know, if we went back six months ago, we couldn't imagine so much money coming through the church to even do that. And, but that's the way that God works. That's how he wants to work through your life. And many times he brings us to that 11th hour so that we will be trusting in him. There are many times I just have no idea how we're going to pay the bills or how we're going to press on. But God has said, I just want you to trust me. You know, share the need and leave it with me and move on. I was often encouraged by a story that took place in 1924 for Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas. And at Dallas Seminary, they were almost at the place of foreclosure. And a group of men had gathered together to pray. And in that room, there was the president, Lewis, Sher uh, uh, Lewis Perry Schaefer, get his name straight. And there was another great preacher, H.A. Ironside. You might have heard his name. But anyways, they're praying that God would provide. And they're in cattle country. So H.A. Ironside was known for his wit and his candor. And as he prayed, he said, Lord, he said... You own the cattle of a thousand hills. Maybe you could sell a few of them and give us the money so we can pay for the debts. 
And while he was praying, a Texan came into the office. He talked to the lady at the front desk and he said, you know, he said, I've been doing a deal with a couple carloads of cattle and the deal hasn't gone through. So he said, I decided I would sell the cows and he said, God's told me I'm to bring a check. And here is the check for all the cows that I've just sold. I don't know if you need the money or not. And the young woman who took the check, she was kind of timid. She didn't know if she'd interrupt the prayer meeting. Listen, if anyone sells Carlo to cows, interrupt my prayer meeting, okay? Just come right in. And she knocked on the door and she spoke to the president and she said, this Texan came in and the, the president looked at it and he recognized the name. And he tapped Harry on the shoulder and said, Harry, you can quit praying now. God sold the cows. God sold the cows. You see, this generosity. We see generosity all through the book of Nehemiah. Remember the king? Have you forgotten Artaxerxes? He gave him all that he needed and he kept stepping out. And the people still forgot that message. And so Nehemiah is reminding them of it right here. The next principle is this. If the first one is do it right or don't do it all, we come to chapter 11 and it's this. It's called embrace your place. As leaders, and I don't care who you are today, you lead in some capacity, but I want to encourage you to embrace your place. I believe very specifically, as I was going through that, it was like the Spirit of God was saying, this is going to apply specifically for some individuals. I don't know who you are. I'm not preaching to you, but I'm just going to, yeah, I am preaching to you. But you know what? You know who you are. Let's look at this amazing passage. So now they're coming back in, and guess what? The city is there, and, uh, but nobody wants to live in the city. They got comfortable living out in the country. Why was that? It was probably safer because the marauding enemies would come in and attack in the city where more people were. So if you had half a brain, you say, I'm going to live out in the country, maybe in a cave or a tent or someplace like that. I'm going to stay outside of the city. But now the walls are up, and they need people to move in and to inhabit the city. And so what happens? Uh, Some of the people willingly chose to do that. We read in verse 2, and the people bless all the people who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. They say, yeah, you go for it. If God's nudging you, do that. But I'm just going to stay back where I am because I'm pretty comfortable and I don't want to move. Is that a little bit like you? I just want to be comfortable. We want to get it all lined up. We'll pray for other people, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to move out of my comfy chair. And then they said, we still need more. So we're going to draw straws. Or actually, it says they cast lots. And one out of 10 said, you know, they drew the short straw and said, okay, that's the word. I'm to move into Jerusalem. And that's how they began to repopulate the city. Well, that sounds like an interesting story, doesn't it? But what's in it for you and for me? What is it that God is trying to teach us through this principle? I think there's a couple things. You and I need to realize that as we are called to embrace our place, whether it's out in the country or in the city, we all have a place. Some of you have a home. Some of you have an apartment. Some of you are more mobile. You're doing something else. Some of you have just moved here. Others of you are thinking, well, maybe there's something else. But a lot of times, the nature of us as humans is that we want to create a comfort comfortable spot for us. Here is the problem. When we get really comfortable, we don't trust God. And there is nothing like living in the place where you are trusting God. And maybe for some of you, God is calling you to move here. I I keep asking people over the last two years, I'd run into people and say, why don't you move here and help me out? And they just kind of look at me like I had three eyes. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? God called me to come here. Why might he not call you? Or maybe God's calling you to go do something else. Maybe, to, maybe we're going to start another church. And you're going to say, I want you to go and move to another side of the city. I get so charged when I hear stories of people who um, want to be a part of seeing a new work established. And they actually change their jobs and they move different places. See, the problem is in the Christian community is we got ourselves so lined up that we need to create as much comfort for us as possible. That's not necessarily how God wants us to be. It doesn't mean he doesn't want us to enjoy things. But I believe we miss out on so many surprises. I could tell you so many stories, and some of you know um, a little bit of our story, but we've lived in four different provinces. We've lived in 10 homes that we've owned. 
And, uh, and then we've lived uh, Airbnb. We've done a number of different things that have happened. But sometimes God would nudge us and say, you know what, I want you to move. And guess what? You might think the Sherbinos just think it's real easy to pack up and move. Not so. I mean, I, I know what's involved, and it's horrific. And we've downsized so many times that I think we could have started several thrift stores. But, you know, we just like the rest of you. We accumulate stuff, and then you've got to go through it, and, and you've got to go and meet new friends and people. But God, at times, calls us to do things like that. He was calling these people to do it, and could it be some of you right now, God is calling you, he's nudging you to take a big move. About 15, 16 years ago, I was invited to go to Winnipeg to preach, and it was the end of March, and I got off the plane, and it was minus 30 degrees. I said, Lord, please, I don't want to go here, and, uh, and I can still hear the, the crackling of my shoes on the cold ground as I walked, and I said, this is the end of March. And uh, a church was interested in us coming to pastor, but I tried to convince them that it wasn't God's will. But you know, about six years ago in 214, the Lord called us again. I was working outside and I got a phone call from a headhunter. And he said, I think you're the right person to come and lead a church. I said, really? I thought I had this conversation with God 10 years ago. And God began to nudge us and so we went. And I can't tell you all the story because we don't have time, but I'm gonna tell you this. When I stepped out to leave and then Terry was gonna follow us, we said, we're gonna learn to love Winnipeg. We're gonna learn to love the cold and everything about it and the oversized mosquitoes and all those neat things that go with that specific area. As I drove across the country, the enemy wanted to discourage me. I must have stopped about 30 times over the, you know, a couple days for gas or food and whatever. And people say, oh, you're moving. Where are you moving from? Vancouver. Where are you going to? Winnipeg. And they'd look at me as if I was nuts. The kicker was this. One day I was in Winnipeg and we were remodeling our little house and I went to a Home Depot and there was this guy that was muscle bound just like me, you know, weightlifter. And why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Anyways, he was there at working at Home Depot and he was telling me where things were and I was trying to buy something. I said, I'm renovating a house. We just moved here. And he said, and all of a sudden I knew where it was going to go. He said, where'd you move from? I'm thinking, I don't want to talk about this. And I just looked at him and I said, from Vancouver. He said, you moved to Winnipeg? And then he paused and he stood back because he was kind of a a macho looking guy. He says, man, he said, I know why you moved here. There's only two reasons. He said, either somebody's paying you a whole lot of money or you got a woman on the side that you don't want your wife to know about. (laughs) That's the truth. And I'm looking at him and thinking, wrong, wrong. But I'll tell you what it was. God was calling me to go there. And you know what? Some powerful things happen, some difficult things, many good things that I never could have scripted. Where is God calling you? Is he trying to move you out of your comfort zone? It might not be to move across the country and all my friends in Winnipeg watching today, I love you. And you know what? We're having a little bit of snow today, but I know you're getting a whole lot more and it's a lot colder. So God bless you and bundle up. Anyways, you know, we just leave it at that and we'll move on. Where is God calling you? Because you see, make a difference where you are. Make a difference where you are. Seize the moment, the neighbors that are around you, even with COVID. And what we see is that community is what counts. And so we see a beautiful thing happening in verse 3. The chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem, and then in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his property and in their towns, Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants. And what it is, it's a picture of harmony. They, They were in their right place. You might not think you're in your right place, But if God is telling you to be there, it's the right place. Even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging, just because you're not experiencing physical comfort or say, oh, this is my aha place, doesn't mean for a moment that you might not be where God exactly wants you to be. And some of you today are in a hospital. Some of you might be dealing with a sickness and that's not what you want. I get that. But what do we learn from Jesus? Said, who for the joy set before him endured the cross? And so friends, I want to invite you to stay in the middle of God's will, wherever it is he's directing you or forcing you to go. And and you know what? He won't force you. He'll just nudge you and nudge you. This is where I want you to go. And we have an opportunity to participate and to be in partnership with him. I think Nehemiah teaches us to embrace our place, but he's going to teach us something else. Something else that's a beautiful thing is celebrate the win. Celebrate the win. And we see the wall has gone up 
the people are coming back in and there is an incredible celebration. I think it's a little foretaste of what is going to happen when we get to heaven. There is an incredible celebration that takes place in Jerusalem. Good leaders know the need to celebrate the wins of what God has been doing. The Bible says one day we're gonna to get to heaven and we're gonna celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb. We're gonna look at our Savior and see his nail-pierced hands and realize that he has defeated the enemy and that we are alive eternally for him because of what he has done. And that's why we come to the book of Revelation. We read in chapter 11, it says they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. It's an incredible, incredible celebration. And this passage in Nehemiah is a bit of a foretaste of what it's like when God's people celebrate his presence in their midst, when God is doing something. I believe God is doing something here at North End Church, and I'm convinced he wants to do something even greater as we walk in obedience with him. But here's the kicker. It starts off, if we're going to celebrate what God is doing, we need to be right with God. And that's what we see in verse 30. Before the celebration happened, it said the priests and the Levites purified themselves and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. You know, the idea of purification is an ongoing process. The moment I trust Jesus as my Savior, I'm forgiven of my sins. But guess what? I still sin. There are things that go wrong. And that's why daily I need to confess my sin. If I don't confess my sin, there's not going to be his joy in my life. There's, I'm going to be quenching his spirit. And many times we quench his spirit, sometimes because we haven't embraced our place. You've been grumbling and complaining about where you're located. Remember that passage back in chapter 11? And you know what? Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content. Being, being content. Being content with where God has placed us, realizing that he is more than enough. But day by day, I need to be right with him. And so we see the example, the leaders, they said, we just want to be right with God before we celebrate. Because we can't really celebrate God if we're living a double life. You know what that's like. I think of different times when people have, you know, committed moral failure in churches, and we see that with leaders. But I've also seen times where people have confessed, and I've seen how their lives are restored. And I'm reminded of two families that I walked with through that whole rubble. And that's exactly what happened when, when the failure, the sin came into their marriage and it fell apart. It was just like the walls of Jerusalem. But I've also seen where God was able to build those walls up. And I want to speak a word of hope to you today, that regardless of what your sin is or what you've been involved with, if you confess it, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. And God wants to rebuild you. He wants to rebuild you. There is a place for you. He's the God of the second chance and the third chance. But just don't play that. Just don't, you know, think, you know, as Paul said, should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have a Savior who gave his life for you and for me, and we need to recognize that. But if we are going to truly celebrate and praise God and raise the rafters in this place, we need to be right with him. And then look at the incredible picture. Two choirs get on the wall. Now, the wall at some point was six feet wide. Some other places it might have been 20 feet wide. But I see these choirs, they're both at two different ends, and they're singing maybe back and forth. How cool was that? I just wish I could have been in that choir. I can see them up there. I see some of the teenagers up there with the old people. They're dragging them up. Let's get up on the wall. We're going to sing. They're standing up there, and they're singing the praises to God. And there's probably a few of the teenagers, you know, they're holding on to their other buddy, and they're hanging way off the wall and just having fun and they're rocking back and forth they got their cell phones out and they're you know, doing the, no they didn't have those back then but you know what they're rejoicing they are having fun and that's what God wants he wants his people to rejoice and to rejoice in the victory that is ours and so I just look into this passage and it's just so uh, powerful how they gave him praise and here's the, the scripture that jumped out at me in verse 43 the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away this is a time when as a church in the midst of a pandemic when there is doom and gloom that they need to hear our joy they need to hear our joy in our conversations as we talk about the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's walk in that, people. Let's, uh, let's live it out. And then the final principle we're going to unpack today in about two minutes is this. We, leaders are called to stay the course. 
The short version of the story is Nehemiah finally goes back to Susa, the capital. I believe it's after 12 years. He has to go back to his main job. He's there for a little while. Things are all, you know, tickety-boo back in Jerusalem. He's got things lined up, but there's a problem. And uh, the problem is with this guy, Eliashib, the high priest. There's been some intermarriage. And do you remember that pesty old guy that we talked about weeks ago, Sanballat? You know, just that ornery guy that was always stirring the pot. Well, he waits for Nehemiah to leave and he wants to get back in. And through a marriage relationship, he probably leans on Elisha, the high priest, and he says, you know, Nehemiah's gone and, you know, you better get back to those old relationships. And he is trying to milk it for his financial gain. And he convinced the high priest to clear a place out of the temple so he can set up camp and live right there. You see, as a leader, you're going to realize sin is always wanting to come back. Temptation will always be there. It'll come back in various forms and ways. And Samballot is waiting for the first opportunity. There's a lot we could say about that, but let me just talk about the, the, the upside. Nehemiah comes back. Oh man, I wish I could have seen him. He is literally ticked off. The scripture says that he was angry when he heard what this Eli, uh, Tobiah had done. He grabs his stuff and just pitches it out of the temple. Wouldn't you love to see that? Just grabbing the bed, get it out of there. The chair, kaboom, you know, he's tossing it. And there's his little coal oil lamp. He just takes that and slams it against the wall outside. I know I'm just reading into it a little bit, but let me tell you this. You know, he didn't call ABC movers and sons. Nehemiah was just ticked off. He said, get out of here. And there's a picture there of cleansing out the temple. And we got to do that in our own lives. We need to be ruthless with evil when it comes in. You know, we got to keep the house swept. Then Nehemiah has to address the fact that they weren't handling the money properly. And we got to keep the books clean. In verses 10 to 11, they weren't paying the people. So a lot of the, the Levites and the people that took care of the temple, they had to go back and do their other jobs. And there was a lot of neglect. And so what happens is Nehemiah comes in and says, we got to put some reforms in place. We got to do things right. And in the midst of it all, as a leader, here's the final thing. Nehemiah preserves his uniqueness. You are unique before God. God has gifted you in a certain way. Don't doubt it. Don't minimize it. And go in that strength. And what was Nehemiah's uniqueness is that God was calling him over and over again as a leader to keep encouraging people, to keep pointing them in the right direction, to not give up, to not give up in calling people back to the straight and narrow and say, let's keep Jesus at the center. I wonder if Nehemiah took his cue from his mentor, mentor who'd lived, you know, hundreds of years before him. And that was Joshua, where Joshua comes at the end of his journey and he looks out at the people. And the last thing he says as a leader is, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so in the journey of leadership, and I want to invite the worship team to come right now, but in, in or rather Andrew's going to come in a moment, but in the journey of leadership, don't forget this. Don't forget this. It's the little things that count. And as we are consistent in the little things, as we stay true to our calling, as we keep the Lord at the center, blessing will come on people. It will start in your own life. It'll start with your family, in the community where you live, and in the country that we're all a part of. May God grant that we lift up and encourage the gift of leadership because it is desperately needed today.